All right, we're going to get started because I have a lot of slides and I probably won't get through them all. Uh, but that's okay. Since we're capturing the talk online, they're all going to be available to you. Okay. Um, how many, don't yell out, but just raise your hand. How many of you have pruned before? Oh boy, I'm preaching to the choir. Okay. Um, I prune, and I'm a minimalist. I'll, I'll say that up front. I prune only when I have to. And you'll see how I prune, why I prune, when I prune. And again, this comes some from learning from my father and my grandfather. Some of it came out of books. So I have a mix of the art and the science of pruning. Uh, the worst thing you can do in a new tree planting is, or, or any tree planting, is just plant it and walk away. Um, if you expect it to grow fast and have well-formed trees. Uh, there's so many different talks that I give across the state and the region. Uh, I do safety talks, so we prune around power lines. We're not going to talk about that today. We can have an entire talk on health, form, and quality of trees. That's where I'm going to focus today's talk. We can prune for appearance, and we can make trees do some really interesting and some cool things by how and, uh, you prune. And then I can violate almost all the rules I'm going to talk about today when I prune my apple trees for production. And we probably won't have time for that. That's a whole nother uh, can of worms when you begin to prune for production. So quality for we all want walnut, oak, that are just ramrod straight, that are beautiful, uh, that are veneer grade. And it all starts the day that seed or that tree was planted. And you begin to work with that tree. And really, when it comes down to it, you're trying to maintain a single leader, a single stem of, of fast-growing material. And when you're, when you're looking at, at selling logs, you want the defect to be in as small an area as possible. And so we're going to go back and forth as to how do we keep that defect in a small area and how do we, I keep hearing echoes, how do we um, maximize growth? Because you're going to have a trade-off there and we're going to talk about that. So it really starts with picking the right sites, good quality sites, good soils, matching the tree species to that soil, keeping them growing fast. It's going to take out a lot of the work. All right. High density plantings result in the best form. Those trees that have to fight for vertical growth and, and canopy sunlight are going to stretch out faster. They're going to self shade and prune their branches faster. Pruning is very expensive. And so there's a fine line between letting mother nature decide who the winners and losers are and you going in and pruning for form and, and uh, function. So first rule is be lazy. Prune only when you have to, if there's storm damage or if you need to save something. You're going to hear about crop tree concepts in probably some of the other talks. And carry that over to your pruning. When you plant six, seven, eight hundred trees per acre, you do not need to prune six, seven, eight hundred trees per acre. All right? You're going to focus and give a social security number, a name, to about 50 trees per acre. That's all that, in the end, will be growing on that plot of ground. And if you start early, proper pruning, proper crop tree, you can speed up the growth of those trees an order of magnitude or more. So if you look at 100 trees per acre, that's 21 foot spacing. That's still on the high end of what I want to prune. At that 50 foot margin, if I train my eye between 28 to 30 feet and have a tree that I work on, that's really where I want to be, given our soils, our climate, our species makeup. So again, kind of a rough pruning guideline. You're keeping your defects within six inches. So we're looking at plantations that have closed their canopy. They've vied for, for dominance, for height growth but they're still smaller than six inches. I want that core to have all of the knots and, and the pruning cuts in that six inch core. And then all the wood that you add beyond six inches is going to be good, clear, high valued, hopefully wood. 
Uh, so again, focus on the main species. If you're focusing on walnut, cherry, or if we were in the Northeast US, sugar maple, uh, if you're looking at, at conifers, you know, white pine, pick the species that's growing the best that you want to focus on. Pruning too early defeats the superior genetics. All right, if you prune before they've had a, a time to fight it out, you don't know if you're picking the best tree growing on the best site. All right, prune too late, you may lose species diversity. All right, so it's when you're in there pruning, you can pick and choose winners and losers. So if, if there's an oak that you want to rescue, you can prune around it, you can open it up, and you can do some corrective pruning. All right, when do we prune? And I'm going to go through a lot of slides here, so I, I move awfully quick. Um, my time is December, January, first part of February, sometime into November, but I'm normally sitting in a bow stand. You can do it if, if you don't hunt. Uh, I prune my bleeders, my maples, my birches, my walnuts, late into the summer and preferably right at that uh, time, right after leaf fall. Uh, but you can prune them in the, in the summer. We're done pruning now, all right? We, it's warming up, the sap is beginning to flow. Um, it's unsightly. You just don't want to prune now. We, we completely avoid the spring grow out period. Think of a tree as a bank account. To pull or, or, or to, to expand their leaves, to grow new branches, new wood, it takes energy away from that tree. It's taking stored energy to put those leaves out and those shoots. If you prune during that time, there's no way that tree can put the energy back into its bank. All right? So that's why we avoid that spring grow out period. Likewise, we avoid when they're color changing in the fall because it's part of that color change that they've been learning about is it's pulling in micronutrients. It's pulling it back from the tree, all right, back from those leaves into the stems. Some trees are pulling in, in about 50 to 60 percent of the micronutrients that they need for next year's growth. So if you cut it off, you're telling that tree your root system has to go out and find and make up that 50 or 60 percent of those micronutrients. So it's really interesting. Um, I always thought, well, once the trees are, are starting to go, it's OK. Until those leaves have dropped, those trees have the potential to take stuff back in to their branches to use next year. One of the biggest rules, and I always get called, uh, you know, my oaks are dying. Why are my oaks, oak trees dying? And I think I have oak wilt. Um, and I'm not an entomologist, but I do exactly what they do. I throw up these huge pictures of bugs, and you lose all sense of scale. That is a picnic beetle, all right? And so when you open uh, a can of beer, or you open a fruit salad, and you have a picnic out on your back porch, and you get those little black bugs that come flying into it, that's a picnic beetle. They carry the oak wilt fungus on their back to an open, and they can carry it to an open pruning wound, especially oaks. They love the smell of oak sap. So I put up there February to October is the period that we don't recommend pruning. Now, if a pathologist was here, they would look at the side that is the spore mats and when the fungus is out there and, and when it's in most concentrations, and they might tell you a different time. I don't want to tell you a time frame that could potentially kill your tree. I'm very conservative in when I prune my oaks, and we're done pruning our oaks already. If the bug can be flying around, I figure it could potentially be taking that fungus to my open wound. I want to stop well ahead of time so that wound can begin the sealing process, meaning it's drying out. Once that wound is dry, that bug isn't going to be attracted to it. But I guarantee you, if you cut a wound today, it's going to run enough sap weeks down the road when that bug is out flying around. So the best way to know if you can prune your oak trees, put some fruit salad or a half a can of beer in a pie plate, stick it on the porch. Those picnic beetles can normally find that in 15 to 20 minutes. And in the dead of summer, it's probably two minutes. If you see picnic beetles, don't prune your oak trees. 
What happens if you do and you, you uh, start to see wilting from your trees? Well, if you cut off a branch, and it's about a one inch branch is normally what we look at, you cut it off and you can either do as a forester does, which means lick the cut end, or if you don't want to do what a forester does, stick it in some water, all right, make that end wet. And what we're looking for is over time it'll oxidize and it'll form these little black dots. And that's the oak wilt fungus in the vascular structure that's clogging up the tree. And it's not allowing for moisture, water to move through that tree. And your leaves begin to brown out. That's what we want to avoid because oak wilt can spread from oak tree to oak tree to oak tree. And mainly what I deal with when oak trees are dying, it's because of improper pruning or some damage to the tree during the growing season. <coughs> All right, let's get back to, to actually training seedlings and saplings at the early stages. Normally, I don't want to work in my plantations until their canopies have closed. But there's evenings that I just want to go out and prune. I want to get away from the family, and I do that by pruning. So I tinker. I know I'm pruning way more than 50 trees per acre, but I tell my wife I just have to do what the trees need it. Uh, so I tell her every tree needs a single straight form, and that's what I'm going for. So I look at the leader. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through a series of pictures, and we're going to talk about how do we fix this. Because of a lot of us, when we have that one tree, it seems like the best tree gets either buck rubbed or the birds land on a new branch and then it breaks off. Uh, something ends up killing it. We, we just, you know, the best tree always ends up getting hurt. So here, it's a little blurry picture, but the tip died, the, the, the growing point died. So what do we do with it? We don't want to just let the tree go. We want to fix it. We have all of these other branches now trying to vie to be the main leader. And the last thing you want is to have two or three or four main leaders vying for dominance. That's not going to produce a good tree. So what I would do, or what I did, is you can simply come in. You can nip this one off here at the branch ridge and collar. And we'll have a blown up picture of that. And I took this off. And in time, this now will be my main leader growing up. I'd probably wait at least one year, and I'd come back through, and I'd either cut this off and subvert that. I'd take that bud, which sends out hormones, telling it to grow. I'd, I'd nip that end bud off, or I would come right back down here in a year and cut that branch off as well. You never want to remove too much from a tree all at once, especially when they're young. The more you take off from a tree when it's young, the slower it's going to grow, and the less stem taper it's going to have. And we all want trees to grow just as fast as they can, both vertically and horizontally. And that comes from all the side branches that are producing luxury photosynthate. Really, if the tree doesn't need it for survival, you're adding growth with all those other branches. So that's what I would do on this one. But you can also take it in another way. And here we have that dead tip again. And we have two or three main leaders. But they're not always straight. Sometimes they kind of come off at an odd angle. And you don't know, now what do I do? This thing is, is forked out. And it forms a V. What you can do is use the two branches to train one of them into a good stem. So I've chosen, this is going to be my new leader. I've nipped off that little dead bud, or broken bird bud. And here's my new leader, all right? And right next to it is my anchor point. And I'm going to, to take, uh, don't use duct tape. <clears throat> the best thing you can do is go into the bedroom and do this when your spouse isn't home. And you grab a pair of their pantyhose, all right? And I'm serious. You rip one leg off, OK? <laughs> Serious? The best thing to use are pantyhose, all right? You rip one leg off. You hide the one leg that you don't need, because you'll need it in time. And you take the other pantyhose with you. And you use the pantyhose as a wrap. It's soft. It's a little bit stretchy. And if you forget about it in a year, it's rotted away, all right? 
Because normally if you use duct tape or some hard binder, you're going to invariably forget to take it off. And that's bad for the tree too. So pantyhose are the best thing to use. You tie them together. You force this one to be straight. Now what I would do is at the same time I do that, I would take my, my hand loppers and I would cut this off right here. And that's cutting off all of these buds up here. It's telling me, or it's telling this plant, this is my main dominant bud. That's the one that's going to have apical dominance. It's the one that's going to grow vertical. In one year, this thing should have lignified straight. All right, it's now upright. Come in, cut this one off. You're home free. You, ha you should have, at that point, one dominant leader to this tree. All right? It works like a charm. Just make sure you hide the other leg so she doesn't find the pantyhose. <clears throat> what do you do with a tree that's an absolute mess? You show up and the deer have just annihilated it. They've rubbed it or the blackbird landed on it and you didn't see it and it got cracked off and two years comes by and, and you got four or five massive branches. And it's in a location where you really want a nice tree. Uh, this is one of those, you've got some sprouts coming off the bottom, you've got multiple leaders. Um, this is one of those hit the reset button trees, all right? This is an extreme version of pruning and uh, it's a low coppice. This is one that the only time I use a chainsaw is when you really don't have to think very hard, all right? Because your IQ really does drop when you start the saw, all right? If this is all you have to do, you can handle it with a chainsaw. But this is a ruin the chain, all right? That's how low you want to coppice this tree. No more than half inch above the, the ground. That's where you're going to make that cut. Lower is better. We do this in the fall. Leaves, <coughs> leaves have fallen. I'm going to have some coffee. <coughs> leaves have fallen. All the reserves are down in that root. You're looking at a several year old root system. And right around the root collar, where it goes from root into stem, there's all these really good buds. They're well attached and they will form a nice tree. You cut it off and you walk away. Well, you cut it off, you put a shelter on it or a cage because the rabbits and the deer are going to find it. You wait a year and you come back to it. And this is what you're going to find. All right, this is that stump. It has multiple sprouts. Normally, by waiting one year, you're going to have a winner. There's going to be a big sprout. And given a, a three, four, five year old stump, you could have one whip. And, and last year we cut off a three year old oak. In one year it grew, I think it was 88 inches. All right? One year. All right? It's a good way to get trees past deer. All right? Because they just can't eat it as fast as it's growing. And 88 inches should be above the height of deer. So that's a good option. But now we're stuck with all these sprouts. So what do you do? Now we take them down after the leaves have fallen. We go down to one main stem. And you may have to do this for a few years. But over time, what happens is this tree, and this is now going to be a new tree on a, a two to three year old root system, over time it forms its own root system. It segments off the old one, grows a new root system in time. You've just given it a great head start. It's a great way to, to deal with damaged trees or poorly formed trees. Here's an oak. This is a two-year-old oak coppice. All right? So that's what the base looks like. That's a two-year-old oak tree. I wouldn't mind a two-year-old oak tree looking like that. All right? Uh, again, it started from something that was poorly formed, two-year-old root system, and it went pretty good. Like I said, I'm a minimalist. I don't like to give you a lot of rules, but there are two rules that I live by. <clears throat> First is you correct multiple leaders whenever you find them. It doesn't matter if it's in a tree planting. It doesn't matter if it's uh, a tree in your yard. You always correct multiple leaders whenever you find them. And the second, 
and that deals with getting trees to grow just as fast as we can. I leave branches on until they're one inch in caliper and I remove them in general by their time they're two inches in caliper. What that does is it, it provides all that luxury production. All those leaves, they're just adding stem growth, so girth growth to that tree. If you cut them off ahead of time, and I'll show you some pictures, I'll show you exactly how trees respond when you poodle top a tree. So this is a double leader tree, um, and it's really common in conifers that are open grown and almost any tree that if you got it from a nursery um, as a potted material, they just seem to respond to being opened up and putting into a new environment by throwing multiple leaders. So it's, it's really common. It's one of those things you don't need a lot of specialized equipment. You're going to use a pair of hand loppers that are sharp. Uh, you make the decision which one goes. They almost all uh, always tell you which one's better formed. You're going to take one down and just keep going. All right? It's a simple, easy fix when you catch it early. And this is one of those, you may have to go through that plantation on an annual basis for the first few years and look at those leaders. This is another one we face. And, and this, can, this is a shot taken in, in uh, somebody's dooryard, but it easily could be in your plantation. And what we're looking at is double leaders. And we're looking at that green arrow and that is a disaster waiting to happen. So you have a poorly formed branch. And when we talk about poorly formed branches, we're talking about those ones that are from a 90 to a 45. Those are good branch patterns. Anything above a 45 degree is going to have long-term problems. And when you're driving down the road after a storm, and you look over and you see your neighbor's tree that has split apart and half of it's laying on the ground, it started off because it probably had a double leader or a poorly formed upper branch that was too sharp of an angle, too acute of an angle. And that's how it started. So we want to address those. So how do we do it? Um, I do a lot of workshops and invariably um, you, can, you can tell those that have a little age on them um, they listen uh, a little better and they do as I say. Uh, I have a lot of youth that uh, they think brawn can overcome brains. And in pruning, a few things happen rather quickly if you try to use brawn over brains. Um, and I, I can attest to it, and I have the cuts on my uh, forearms to show it. I don't like a double eater, so I decided to take this one off. And I thought, you know, I'm young, I'm a guy, I'm strong. I can just hold it with one hand and I can just prune with the other. I'm going to, one cuts faster than three. All right? So in rapid succession, a lot of things will happen. Um, your IQ drops because you picked up the saw. You then hold one side of the tree. You have the saw with the other hand. And normally this is taller than we can reach, so you're on a ladder. All right, so we've just taken both hands out of the equation. All right, so what does the young gentleman do? He wraps his legs around the tree, around the ladder, holding the branch and cutting, okay? There is no one in this room that is strong enough to hold a two inch branch while trying to keep yourself on a ladder and manipulate a saw, all right? What happens is you get through partway through that branch. Physics takes over and the branch and the saw win, all right? The branch comes down, you're trying to hold it. You then realize, I'm falling out of the ladder. So what do you do? You try to catch yourself. One hand's tied to a tree branch that's falling. The other hand has a very sharp saw. Where do you end up with it? You're both on the ground with the saw embedded in your arm because you forgot to let it go, okay? so. And I have the scars to prove it. Um, I've now learned we use a three cut method and that's the only way I use when I'm pruning with a handsaw or actually with a chainsaw if I have to do any big cuts. So we're going to talk about how to do a three cut method. It takes all the, well I don't want to say thinking out of it. It takes all of the strength that you need out of the equation. You work smarter not harder. So I want to take this leader out. And 
it doesn't matter what tree species you're working on, you should always be able to find a few key parts on that tree and know exactly where to prune. If you haven't done a lot of pruning, the best way to learn is to take a workshop where they teach you to prune on someone else's trees. Okay, that's number one. Two, a good pruning workshop doesn't start with saws, it starts with sharpie markers. And you find where to prune and you identify it and you mark it with a sharpie marker and you train your eye and your hand and the saw to move along that sharpie marker line. It's the best way to learn. Again, actually the best way is on somebody else's trees. So what I'm going to do here is a three cut method. Yes, it takes a little bit more time, it's more cuts, but it's safer and it's better for the tree. So my first cut, I've gone up about six to eight inches and I've made my first cut in and I'm only in about a third of the way, maybe half of the way into that branch. Enough that it just barely starts to pinch my saw. It's not going to fall, but it just pinches. My second cut, I come in from the back side and I start to cut. And now I have one hand on the ladder, one hand on the saw, and I don't care about that branch. What that top part of the branch is going to do, you're going to get part way through and it's going to match up to where you've cut below. And all of this is just a natural crack. So the weight of the branch now has cracked off and it's fallen to the ground. So now you're left with just a tiny little stub. It weighs nothing. And you can come in and these maples, these smooth bark maples, are sometimes very hard to find the branch ridge and the branch collar. And what you're going to do, there should be, there we go. You have your branch ridge. Right up in here, there's a little swell, and you don't want to nick that. And it's on every branch, on every tree, whether you're in a plantation or in your dooryard. There's always a swell where there's a ridge, and there's always a swell on a collar. Now, they're not always easily identified. So when you start to prune, go out and look at a red oak. Those branches have a really nice swell right at that collar and ridge. The reason we don't want to cut either the collar and the ridge, you don't want to do the damage, that's where the callus cells are going to start to form to come out and go over that wound. We can tell bad pruning jobs just by walking up and seeing the cut and seeing how those callus cells have formed. All right, and we'll show you some, uh, I've cut the slide down, but we'll, we'll show you some good ones and we'll show you a few bad ones here in a few minutes. Um, and you can instantly tell if they've used target pruning, meaning they're looking for the ridge, they're looking for the collar. This is one of those over pruned, uh, this is an old picture, I, I, uh, I had to steal it but we still see it going on. Um, and again, this one violates my wait until it's one inch rule, all right? So they wanted to mow, they wanted to look out, and so boom, they pruned all the way up. This tree is an inch, this tree's all about three quarters of an inch, all right? There is absolutely no stem taper there because there is no production. All these leaves are just keeping it alive. It's not going to grow. It's not going to put on the girth that you want those trees to do. So when in doubt, leave those small branches. Now, if it's a branch that chronically hits you in the face every time you mow, go ahead and take it off. But don't poodle top that tree, all right? Oh, there we go. Again, more branches means more leaves, which means more photosynthate, which means faster growth. Smaller wounds always heal faster. And I don't, I hate, I shouldn't use the term heal. No pruning wound heals. They all seal over. Because in later years when you cut that tree down and they mill it into lumber, that cut will still be there. It's just going to be overtopped by new wood. So it doesn't heal like you and I. It just seals over and forms new wood beyond. So here's a good example of, of a good stem taper. It's, it's got a single leader. It's got nice branch patterns. It's got nice branch architecture. 
And when you're lifting and pruning up to clear that bowl, that nine foot, if you want a saw log, 17 feet is ideal in the tree planting. You may pick and choose branches as you go up through there, all right? You may have a branch at eight or nine feet that's already one inch, cut it off. You may have some that are half inch down below that are still producing a lot of photosynthate. Wait. Again, you don't want to do it all at once. You want to lift in stages. I lift trees at, and again, I'm, I'm fairly conservative, at about a quarter of the overall height. Meaning, if I have a 20 foot tree, I'm not going to lift more than five feet. All right? And then I'll, I'll come back later in a few years and lift again. All right? By doing that, you maximize your canopy, your crown. Again, it's all about growing fast trees. This is something that starts just as soon as those canopies close in a, in a dense tree planting that could be awfully early. They, they buy for height. You get good, clear uh, growing, and, and then you've got to prune them up for wood. Here's one of those that I show you. I, I jump around, and I've taken this branch off right here. I've left this one at least for another year or two, and then I'll take it off. And then I'll go up even higher and take this one off. And actually, I should have taken that one off earlier because it's a bad form and it's damaged anyways. Um, so you do this in stages. We always do it before heartwood forms. The one thing, and, and you can see this in town, and you can see it in trees that were storm damaged, that they had to prune larger cuts, at about the two to three inch caliper stage on a branch, when you cut it off, and there's heartwood in there. Unless it's a really fast growing tree, it's not going to seal over before decay gets into that heartwood. And heartwood decays faster than sapwood on living trees. It's not to say that it isn't going to seal over. It will, or it should. But there's going to be decay already in, and then it's going to move down into the stem and ruin the log. So you see all those trees that are hollow and they have a branch coming out that's hollow. More than likely it was because it was pruned or storm damaged, decay got in. So we always prune before two and three inches. So here's just a, a diagram of that because my picture doesn't show it well. You look for this branch bark ridge on trees where that comes up. So you see these little triangles right here. That's a fairly good sign. It means there won't be or is not at present something called included bark, which is not good when you're dealing with big trees later on. So we like to see that branch bark ridge coming out. If not, prune it off and you've removed a hazard right there. Again, this collar, sometimes you'll see, especially on red oak, you'll see these little ridges. And that's what you want to be very careful of from. So what we want to do is come out eighth inch to a quarter inch, no more. We don't like to leave stubs. And this is your, going to be your final cut. So the first cut is an undercut. Second cut is the removal where it'll crack off, or you tell it where it could crack. And then the last cut is where you want to make your final cut. No more do we want to say, come straight here and come straight on down. That creates such a large wound, and you've removed those points that will grow callus cells. And then the sealing of that wound takes a lot longer and it does some funky things and we'll show you in a minute. So this is what we want to avoid. This cut down through here, that's a flush cut. Uh, and, and trying to convince people that over time, when that tree gets to be saleable, you're not going to see this little bump if we cut through here. That's where you should be cutting because right there is that little swell. All right, The line should come here. Most people want to cut it flush thinking they're doing the best thing for that tree. You don't want to do that. All right. This is, uh, I drive my wife nuts because I, I prune trees um, across our door yard and then I start repeatedly taking pictures. All right. So what you're going to see is three years of a wound closure on a two inch red oak tree large canopy, I baby it, I fertilize it, and it's gone through two years of drought and one growing season last year 
of fairly decent weather. So this is on the slow end of how I would expect trees to seal over. So this is the day I pruned it, February 18th, 2012. Nine weeks later, it has dried out. You want to see these cracks. This doesn't bother me. This tells me there was a little bit of sap left in there that ran. Again, by April 25th, it was pretty warm. Those bugs were out, so I did take a little bit of a chance because there was sap that they could be attracted to. So I had an open, active wound that those bugs could have brought oak wilt to. So it's drying out. You can also begin to see the bark begin to separate from the wood right around the outside. All right, 15 weeks later, you're looking in here, all right? Right there, you're starting to see the callus formation around that tree. Now, that's about 16th to an eighth of an inch, and it's bright green. This is new wood, this is new formation occurring. Again, it's beginning to photosynthesize, that's why it's turning green. 28 weeks, 35 weeks, one year. It still hasn't turned the corner yet. And when I say turn the corner, it's grown out and come over. All right, that's what we call turning the corner. Now it has at 22, one year 22, one year 31, two years and five weeks. You also can tell I'm not a photographer. Two years 12, two years 17, 20, 27, 34, 40, two days ago. So three years and I still don't have full closure on a two inch cut on a red oak that has been babied other than the two years of drought. Um, and this is a healthy tree. You start to see some of this stuff. Um, Sometimes on this new growing wood, you'll start to pick up these little bit, bits of damage. Um, that was a squirrel that didn't make it back to the other trees. Um, again, I protect my trees uh, and eat the squirrels. So you, you have to worry about some level of damage um, from little critters. They seem to key in on some of these wounds. It's, it's nutritious, it's fast growing, it's, and I've seen it on other ones. They seem to key in on my, my uh, trees. I'm hoping that within a year, with a good growing season, that will be sealed. But that's four years of, of growth that, that it's taken to overcome that wound. So let's talk about dead branches. So that was on a live branch that, that I pruned, and it took four years. This, tell, this is a great picture. It, it shows you naturally what that tree is trying to accomplish, all right? On some trees that self-thin, that, that branch dies and they shed down, I mean, it makes our lives so much easier when those branches just die and drop off. And it goes through this process naturally. Those that, we, that, that hang on to dead branches that we have to go in and prune, you can do that at any point in the year, all right? I don't like to work when the mosquitoes and the you know, noceums are out, so I don't prune in the summer, but you can. But again, you don't want to hit that new growing, and that is callus tissue. Now, if I didn't prune this off, or if I left a stub, if I left a, a one inch, two inch, six inch stub, like this, this tree would sit there and it would grow, and it would grow, and it would grow, and it would put new callus cells out over that dead wood and try to overcome that wound, all right? It would try to grow out and seal over that wound. We don't leave stubs. No tree can overcome a stub before it begins to decay. The whole goal of pruning is to remove defects and prune out and make sure that there isn't going to be decay in that stem. So, dead branches, prune at any time. Wound dressing. I hate to ask this question. Show of hands, how many of you use pruning dressing? Anybody admit to it? Okay. Let's, let's go home, take pruning dressings, any of these and anything else that you have, and dispose of them properly. All right, we don't use those anymore. We've learned a lot about the creosotes, the tars, the shellacs. 
What those now do, it traps moisture in. So moisture trapped behind and with a living in contact with a living tissue begins the decay process faster. All right, that's number one. Number two, it kills and greatly reduces the growth rate of the callus cells, the callus tissue. So we don't recommend it anymore. All right? None of these guys. You, you don't have to, and, and we've seen it all, you know, just smeared on roofing tar. I love the one, they went out and, and they couldn't find the pruning dressing, so they bought this thing. I didn't even know they sold electrical tape that's now liquid. It's rubber. And they had, came home with red rubberized electrical tape. And they had beautiful pruning cuts, but that tree was just a polka dot. Um, hopefully you're not in the audience. So this is what we try to get away from. Uh, it's, it's unsightly, and it's killing those cells. This tree then has to form new cells way out here where it really doesn't want to. That's not where those callus cells want to form. All right. So again, you greatly increase the length of time that it's going to take for that pruning cut to, to seal over. All right, we've already talked about why we don't use them. So again, I always seem to put up a rule and then violate it almost within two slides. The only time I would ever use a wound dressing, and I'll talk about the only one that I would allow or, or use, um, is when you're dealing with oaks and they've been damaged or something just, you have to get that, that branch cut in the summertime. Cut it and immediately paint it with an interior latex-based wall paint, house paint, doesn't matter. Interior based. What that does is it creates that physical barrier for that bug. Bugs don't like latex-based paint. The reason I tell you interior, because by the end of the summer, that wound will have dried out the latex paint will have dried out. You don't need it anymore. And over time, it's going to slough off and not stay on the tree. All right, so no oil-based paints, no, no uh, exterior-based paint. And whatever you do, I was newly married. I did not consult my wife. I went to the paint cabinet, and I painted one of my oak trees. I picked the one I thought she would never use. All right, that was my first mistake. I didn't consult her. It came with our house, so I knew she wasn't going to use it. The problem was it was pink. All right? Make sure it's a spousally approved color. Because you're going to look at it for at least one summer. Um, I learned the hard way. So again, acts as a physical barrier. It does allow the wound to dry, and, and it, it is not permanent. It's going to fall off. All right. Quickly, let's talk about equipment and tools. Um, there's really only two things I use, not three. One is a set of very good bypass hand pruners. You get what you pay for, all right? If you have those old style anvil pruners, the ones that the, the blade comes straight down onto a hard surface, what you're doing there is you're crushing, you're not cutting. So get yourself the ones where the blade will come by the cutting uh, surface. So that's the first thing. Keep them sharp. You know, we see a lot of folks, I do a lot of workshops, they come with their own hand pruners, and I don't think they've ever been sharpened, or a lot of the new ones now, you can just toss the blade and get a new one, all right? But you're looking at spending somewhere between 30 and $60 for a good set. And there are a lot of different manufacturers of these guys. Get one that fits your hand. They make them for small hands, medium hands, make them easy to prune. Get something that you like. And when you find something you like, buy two of them. All right? It's just twice the money. You can say that I said to buy two of them. All right? We do that for sanitation reasons. I don't go from one tree to the next without picking up my next set of pruners that I've had in alcohol. I just, it's a habit that you have to get into. We see a lot of disease. We saw, see a lot of, of insects and, and target the diseases, being moved from tree to tree to tree. 
by pruning equipment. Just get into the habit. Throw one into a thing of alcohol, pull the one that's been soaking in there out, dry it off, wait for it to evaporate off, and prune. I do that for both my saws and my pruning, my hand shears. These guys, up to about a half an inch, you don't have to work so hard. After a half an inch, you begin to really have to reef down on those clippers, and you're going to start to do some physical damage to that stem and to that vascular structure to the callus cells that you need to maintain. Pruning saws. Again, don't buy one, buy two. And here what I'm going to do is I'll tell you, don't buy two of the same thing. Buy one that has a fairly aggressive tooth pattern. And they make different tooth patterns out there, some fine and some coarse. Get yourself a fine one for anything that's half inch up to maybe an inch, inch and a half and then switch over to something with a coarse tooth. These guys are razor saws. Um, I would encourage you always to use gloves with these things. Uh, you shouldn't need anything with a, with, let me start over. In almost every case, you do not need something that you fill with gas and oil, all right? This should be able to do anything in that two to three to four inch range relatively quickly. Those hand saws are really efficient. All right, and they're much more accurate when you're, when you're trying to prune. But they do make different versions when you're pruning up to 17 feet if we're working in our, our plantations. Again, you get what you pay for. These things have replaceable blades, they have good steel, and they're incredibly sharp. These, get yourself a pole pruner that's extendable. Anytime or, or as you get farther away from the ground, so you're going up into the tree, your accuracy is going to be less. And so you have to give yourself a little bit of leeway, maybe leave a quarter inch stub. You don't want to hit that callus. You don't want to hit the ridge. Um, invest in a good one of these. You will hands down never regret it. You also have these guys. This is... Um, we use these on campus, and I can tell uh, if they've had a few cups of coffee, and I can tell if they're not really concentrating, or if I can tell if it's at the end of the day. These things get heavy. They're incredibly easy to use, and, and you start to sneak up into larger size branches because you really don't have to work so hard. But I guarantee you, when you extend that out to the 16-foot limit that it'll go, and try to control that, you're going to do damage. Normally, you're going to nick the bark behind the branch you're cutting. These work great into, in plantations where you just have sheer volume, and you're just going to go right down a row and shear those guys off. But you're looking at not too many cuts, and you're going to start to get tired. And, and so until you get into pruning shape with one of these, you're going to make more mistakes than it's probably worth. They're easy to use you're going to make more mistakes. All right, I'm going to quit here now um, because the, the other pruning talks I have are a lot longer. Um, pruning again, it improves the health, the vigor. You can prune out disease. You can prune out decay. You can prune out damage. You can restart that tree and, and get it to grow from sprouts again. When you're dealing in plantations, remember, you're growing these things to eventually sell the timber, and you've got to factor in your cost, and pruning is expensive. Now, if it's part of your therapy, like it is for me, prune every tree. If it isn't, go back to that 50 to 60 or 70 trees per acre, appropriate spacing, pick the species, and that's where you target all your pruning resources. And if you haven't worked with a forester and, and, and done a crop tree release, have them out or, or have somebody out while you start this process because you can, you can easily invest a lot of time and a lot of energy in the wrong trees. So make sure you know what you're looking at. So always form a dominant leader. Prune when it's from one inch to two inches and you're going to be safe as long as you're pruning in the fall and winter. All right, I've left enough time with questions. 
and I've put them all to sleep. All right, one question. Sometimes with white oaks, um, it looks like they get two meters and one ends up. I mean, how do you take two seasons to keep on the decision? Yep. You know, and so yeah, if, if you're in a, so is it in a plantation style or open grown? Somewhere between. Somewhere um, between. Let's go, I'll, I'll give you two answers. In a plantation, I would say if you're having trouble figuring out which one's the, the dominant leader, give yourself one more year and see if they both equally grow well, then just make a decision which one's the straightest and best attached or, or at the top. Um, if they're not growing equally, pick the winner and, and take the other one off. You can also, if again, like we showed that one example where you tied the one back up, if it's not really good, use it for a year as an anchor, but subvert it. Take that bud off, tie it back, and then in the next year come off and, and, and take it off. Your example of the, of the tree that you trimmed down to half inch and down level. And then you let six or seven, uh, and then you trimmed off the, <coughs> you had one foot, two foot, whatever. Is that too soon to put on one of these tubes over that one? No, uh, I would definitely do that. Put on a tube then and let it get above that 48 or 52 or whatever it is. Hopefully might get it past the deer. Yeah. What do you, speaking of deer, what do you think about stuff you spray on trees for deer repellent? <laughs> So the question was, what, what do you think of that deer repellent stuff uh, that you spray on trees? Um, I know it's getting better. You know, when, when it initially came out, they said that of the, the reapplication time, and it was a lot shorter than what it actually, you know, was advertised as. Um, I think they're getting better. I think, like anything, deer learn, and, and I would go from a, you know, a rotten egg to a blood meal, back to a rotten egg, to high speed lead, to rotten egg. <laughs> there we go, they heard it. I was just checking. Um, I almost ex exclusively use five foot shelters. I have 50 to 60 per acre, uh, and I, I reuse them. And I have not spent a lot of time. I also, you know, in, in, in my bottomland plantings, um, they don't seem to really hit my bur oaks bad. They've left my walnuts alone after the one year where they were jacked up on fertilizer coming from a nursery, uh, so they really haven't bothered those. Um, the one thing I don't do in my plantations, if, if uh, I know where the deer run, because I have a corridor through, um, if they're rubbing on a tree, I give them that tree. I don't ever cut it down, I don't coppice it if it's near a run. You do that, they're going to move right on down, get the next one. So yeah, I've given them trees through there, but I know I have 750 trees per acre. I can give them 20 or 30 or 50. All I need are my 50 to 60 evenly spaced. And I just, I work through it. You know, I have a resident, and, and that's on a, on a 30 acre, I have seven deer that I don't think leave that property. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, as a forester, I'm also a huge hunter. Um, and so I'm really conflicted when it comes to, I'm raising deer food and food plots, and I'm putting in cover, winter cover, with, you know, conifer trees, but I'm also trying to grow high-valued walnut, oak, and I just, because I want the deer, I, I go that little extra mile. I, so that's a long answer to your question. Um, I don't use any of it only because I know I'm not going to be religious enough to go out there every three weeks or four weeks and put an another different application on it. I just bit the bullet. I found somebody that uh, got frustrated with, with uh, having to maintain their tree shelters and it's a yearly maintenance I go out um, and I got them for a buck a piece. So at that rate I couldn't not buy five foot shelters. So. I've had good results using plants here. Plants, okay. And, you know, I, I have a box of it. I just have never, is that a blood meal, a bone meal? So it's a blood, how long do you get out of it? Uh, they say six months. And I will. Okay, they say that, how well? <laughs> I will spray okay. 
in November, early okay. November, and it'll last all winter. Okay, so there's, I guess, an answer that, that's encouraging. And you have deer? Yes. Okay, that's just a, I had to follow that up. Okay. Um, I have found where you can contact some of the um, nylon companies and get their seconds and get a whole lot of those too. <laughs> Don't tell my wife. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, I mean that's a good resource. But they really nylons work well when you're trying to correct a terminal leader. And then you said printing bridge trees is a whole different well, of wax. But at least where you cut, is it the same? Absolutely. It, it doesn't matter if. If I'm pruning for production or if I'm pruning for safety, I always, always, always find the ridge in the collar. And prune right after it. And prune, yep. I, I, and, and as you get better, I would start at a quarter inch, a little bit of a stub. But as you get quickly better, you can, you can shy you know, to an eighth inch. The closer you cut to that, that ridge and collar, the less those callus cells have to form before they come up and over top of that wound. But yeah, it's exact. It's it's target pruning, and and you're looking for that ridge. You're looking for the collar. You do that on any pruning we do. It doesn't matter if you're in a plantation in a dooryard. You do that, you're fine. When you were talking about preventing the spread of disease and alcohol on your pruner, where do you draw the line? Do you read it? Do you do it all the time, or do you or when you stop, like do it on your chainsaw? If I switch, tree, if I go to a new tree, I'm going to take a new set of pruners, put my other ones in, and I'll prune that whole tree, and I'll go to another tree. Yeah, what I saw it at a field day once. A, a guy had made up a, he took a like a three-inch uh, hard PVC. I mean, this was a two-dollar special, three-inch piece of PVC. He he. Uh, Rubber, or not rubber cemented, the, he cemented the, the cap onto the bottom of it so it held a chamber. He cut a little notch in it, about an inch apart, slipped around his belt. Actually, it was a Christmas tree grower. And he just filled it with alcohol, put the pruner in there, and he could go from Christmas tree to Christmas tree. All he'd have to do is put his knife in, pull the next one out, and he'd prune. Now, you'll slop a little bit if you don't make it deep enough. Uh, to hold it, but yeah, that's all he would do, and it worked great. And if you're pruning conifers, throw in a little a couple of drops of pine saw, and it'll take off the pitch of your saws. Now, with chainsaws, that's off, you know, again, if you're actually doing targeted pruning, you probably shouldn't use a chainsaw um, just, just because you're probably cutting too big a branch to actually make it worth it. Again, we're looking at smaller trees to prune for quality and form later on. So, does that answer it? Go. Then you would. Yep. And, and a lot of folks have said, why do you use alcohol and not Clorox? Uh, Clorox is a salt. So anytime you put metal into a salt, not good. I'll just go with the alcohol. I've heard that spray Lysol will also work for that. I think that's exactly as corrosive as that. And it will. Yep. It's an antibacterial. I mean, it's a, basically a sterilant. Okay, how are we doing on time? Or Bill? We're good. We'll keep going. Any other questions? Can you pop us a conifer tree? <laughs> Thank you. You can. You're going to be left with a stump that won't regrow. So um, if you coppice it, you'll only ever do it once. So no, you only coppice hardwoods. Now, if you're enterprising Christmas tree grower and you coppice that tree as in you cut it for a Christmas tree and you leave one whorl of branches down below that are actively growing, you can tip that up and get it to grow a new tree. But it has to have a living bud 
for a conifer to grow. Once you're done with buds, there's no coming back. So no, do not go home and coppice your damaged conifer tree and expect it to grow a new one. Isn't gonna happen. Thank you. You can have a follow-up. That was such a good question. In a hardwood situation, you, you seem to use a parallel to the ground coppice. you have an opinion about the 60-degree coppice? You know, I went through a phase where I would do, and I would do that, but I would do that on a high coppice, all right? And, and that's where you have a, a small tree. You know, it might be less than an inch in diameter, maybe up to two. And, and I, what I'm doing with that high coppice, and he talks about a 60 degree, and I normally, a 45, something sharp, all right? I would do that at the height just below the damage. By doing that, you're triggering the bud right underneath that point to grow. And you're kind of taking away getting six or eight buds growing from the base to one. You're kind of putting all your effort into one bud that grows up. Now there might be a, another one or two that grow, but not six or seven or eight. OK, thank you. Um, so I, I went through that phase. Um, and I high coppiced a couple. and. You know, every once in a while, the damage would be, you know, a foot, two foot, three foot off the ground. Uh, and then I had to replace a tractor tire once because I high coppiced something at a foot and then didn't realize it was there in the snow. And now I have a new tractor tire. Um, and then I thought, I'm only gaining a foot. I'm taking it right down at the ground. So, so we have done that in some situations. So any other ones or you're free to go? This now, uh, again, this will be online here in a little while. And uh, it's now break time. So we have more food for you, drinks. And I'll be around. If anybody wants to sign for CEUs, we have that here.